Oh, here's a song that Grant wrote called The Cannonsville Dam. And uh, I, I really wish that we could all kind of be in one room because I've got questions. Um, <laughs> you know, Grant wrote the song from a, like a perspective, a very altruistic kind of perspective of what we're, we're giving up our land so that people can, other people can have water elsewhere. And that was probably not the prevailing sentiment. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, pl uh, pl farms were taken by eminent domain, and uh, uh, a lot of people had to move and were displaced. And I'm sure most of them weren't happy about it. But anyway, some of my questions there, I just happened to be uh, reading online about, uh, I, I don't know how I came across this thing, and it's, it's a, I think it was a website called It's All About the Hudson Valley. And it, there was a little article written by a, a woman named Kay Turner who used to live in Walton and her grandparents had to move to Walton when they got displaced from Cannonsville. And I think maybe she lives in California now, but I just wrote this, this or read this little thing that she wrote. And, it, and she talked about how beautiful her grandparents' farm was and how much time she spent there growing up and just how bitter they were that they had to, they had to leave. Uh, kind of a contrary to Grant's take on the whole thing. And then I came across this guy who's a contemporary folk singer, I think Hudson Valley, your, your region. And his name is Gary Teed, Gary H. Teed, T-E-E-D. If, and if anybody can comment that uh, if, the, if these names sound familiar, it'd just be interesting to know. Uh, his, he wrote a song called uh, O Cannonsville, and he talks about 50 cents on the dollar and eminent domain and all the stuff that uh, is the, the more bitter feelings that were that created. We had a dam over in our, our part of the, uh, closer to, to us, called the Kinzua Dam, and that, that uh, was built around the same time. And uh, that displaced uh, 600 Native Americans and... Uh, as opposed to Cannonsville Dam, uh, displaced maybe a thousand or so people and wrecked up four little towns. But uh, kind of a different reason that was for uh, flood control uh, going into Pittsburgh, not to divert water to uh, to another place. Uh, anyway, I'll stop yapping, and maybe if somebody knows any of these names that I've been talking about, you could put them in the comments. We know Gary Teed through mutual friends, fellow musician, says Kathy. Maisel Miller says it was not and still not the prevailing sentiment. Too. It was not and still not. Yeah. I'm referring to, uh, to Grants? Yeah. Oh, okay. Ready? Yep. You got to count? When the 
flood comes to the valley, standing miles from shore to shore. When we realize that humans could have done but little more. There'll be many hearts been broken among the young as well and old. For they'll never see their old homes anymore. No, they'll never see their old homes anymore. Have you read a good old Moses with a rod that smite the rock? Then came water for the multitude. Water for the flock. Now the sand has come to us today, like many years ago. We wouldn't turn our backs upon our friends. We would not tell them no. We wouldn't turn our backs upon our friends. We would not tell them no. Grant was displaced by dam projects twice in his life. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Two times had to move. Well, that's got to be a message there. Anyway, this uh, is, Grant was known as a as a dance fiddler, and he played in order to play dances. You must um, play in time and in tune is better. So, and he did that very well. So, and this is a tune. Um, we're going to do a little two-tune medley. The first one's called The Little Red Barn or The Old Red Barn or something like little that. Little Red Barn. Little Red Barn. I think I've seen it under a couple different names. And then we're going to play, Grant, uh, is it Grant's Hornpipe? Or Rogers. Rogers, Rogers Hornpipe, which is actually a jig as well. But he performed this at the Newport Festival. In, but um, it was stated that this is the only, of, only um, two-step jig that was played at the whole Newport Festival. Somebody commented on that. So we're going to play these two little jigs. The first one's called The Little Red Barn. The second one's called Roger's Hornpipe. <laughs>
You know, I read a, uh, a really fun little fact about Grant's uh, in terms of his fiddle music. Let me uh, switch with you. So his father played a little bit of fiddle around the house. And uh, by the time Grant was six years old, he had started to try to play the fiddle. By the time he was seven, he was already sitting at the local square dances. Like they'd bring him and they'd prop him up on a chair, basically. And he'd get to play along with the older musicians. He, I don't think he could... He could uh, he could play the dance by himself at age seven, but this is how he cut his teeth, yeah. so to speak, in playing dances. But he said he got, um, he was sort of the rare traditional fiddler that would get annoyed when he'd hear different versions of the same tune, oh. right? Like yeah. one guy plays Little Red Barn this way, and the, the guy, you know, who came next week played it a little differently. And it used to bother him so much that he said he decided to learn how to read music so he could find the definitive versions of each of the tunes. <laughs> That's cool. As if there is a definitive version of some of them. Right, right, right. Uh, Yeah. So he spent some time uh, in lumber camps. He was primarily known as a, a stonemason. Uh, he worked in quarries um, and was a stone cutter. But he did spend some time working in lumber camps, which, of course, really no look at, at music of the Catskill region is complete without considering uh, the logging industry and the lumber camps where uh, these guys would be cooped up for in the fall and winter uh, in groups together and again uh, had this intense need to make their own entertainment because that was all <laughs> the only option available. Um, so a wonderful tradition in the logging camps. Um, you know, the guys would go in in the late summer, early fall, later in the fall, they go into the woods and if the logging operation was far enough back in the woods, they would just live there for uh, the season, uh, cutting down, um, you know, there was, there was the cutting of the, of the tall, uh, the eastern white pines and such, but also uh, in the Catskills, uh, you know, the virgin hemlock forest was really important for the bark, for the tannery. Um, and so in the logging camps, you'd have 20, 30, 40, 50 men cooped up together in these temporary housing units for, for the season. And, um, you know, sort of uh, their only option was to entertain each other with either a dance, a story, a song, um, or maybe somebody could play an instrument. So uh, he decided he heard a lot of good lumbering songs. So these, these logging songs uh, that the lumberjacks sang would sort of travel with the lumberjacks from region to region. He decided to make one of his own, he said. Uh, he said, well, I figure if, if uh, there's that many good ones out there, maybe I'll see what I can put together myself. So um, this is one he wrote, a uh, sort of fictitious story about an Irishman that comes into a logging camp named Pat McBraid. Come all you boys and gather round, I'm sure the time has come. For many times I've asked you where you've been and seen and done. For now I'm old and tired, no more youthful will I be. I was born in that good old garden state in 1863. As a lad I roamed the shores and fished on the river Delaware. I knew the raftsmen steer the logs where they came, I knew not where. So I became determined it was this I had to learn. Perhaps the boss would give me work, some wages for to earn. So I started out one morning, me bedroll on me back. The food I took, a fishing pole with a hook stuck in me hat. And only when I stopped to rest was hours after dark. Don't be surprised when I tell you guys, here's where the story starts. It's the early days in August when I reached this logging camp. First time since I started that I felt like heading back But soon a man walked up to me, the foreman of the crew He looked me top to bottom saying, what can I do for you? I'm looking for and sure will do me best. Very well, says he, but first you'll have to stand the test. Now go and fetch your chopping axe. Now yonder stands a tree. Eighteen inches on the stump and the minutes you have are three. I'm proud to say I stood me test with a little time to spare. Stuck up me axe and turned around the whole crew standing there. The boss, he blew his whistle, his watch still in his hand. The way it looks, go tell the cook we've got an extra man. He took me to the paying she acts as he give me your name. And 
Whether fake or otherwise, to me it's just the same. But you must have a handle if you're going to be paid. Says I, I'll take my wages, bow to the name of Pat McRae. Through me 50 years of logging, I have seen a mighty change. From river rafts to steamships, from motor trucks to trains. If there's a moral you're looking for, I'm sure it's plain to see. We took the roof from the red man's home to shelter you. Today.